So we're given this function 1 over x squared minus kx where k is going to be a, uh, a value that is redefined throughout the different parts of the problem. And because we're going to use the derivative of this function so frequently, they actually give us uh, the derivative of the function in terms of k. But I should just point out that there's nothing special here. We could have used the quotient rule or the chain rule with negative exponents to find this f prime of x. It's just a convenience. And then we're really doing four pretty separate and distinct operations. It's not as if there's a unifying theme here. Uh, so let's just jump in and we'll use the concepts that are illustrated in blue on the right as we need them. In part A, we simply need to write an equation for a tangent line through a particular point. So again, the key to remember is that we just use point slope form, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, where the x1, y1 is the point that they give us that's on the line, on the curve, and where the m, the slope of the tangent line is simply the derivative evaluated at that point. So with that we're going to first need to calculate the x1 and y1. Uh, so they say, so we, given x equals 4, uh, the first thing we're going to say is what is y? And so we're just going to put that in the formula. We've got um, y equals 1 over uh, 4 squared minus 3 times 4. That's going to be 1 over um, 16 minus 12, which is 1 quarter. Okay. So the point is, so the point of tangency is 4 comma 1 quarter. All right, now we just need to evaluate the slope. And the slope is um, 3 minus 2x over x squared minus 3x, the quantity squared where x equals 4 and if you walk through this you'll um, come up with a slope of negative 5 sixteenths I guess we can walk through that it's going to be 3 minus 2 times 4 all over 4 squared minus 3 times 4 and then that quantity squared we get negative 5 on top, 4 squared minus 3 times 4, we get 4 squared, so negative 5 sixteenths. And so, and I apologize that this has bled a little over into the part I had reserved for section B, but so now we can conclude that the equation of the line is y minus the y1 value 1 quarter equals m negative 5 sixteenths times x minus the x1 value, which is 4. In part b, we have to determine whether the function has a relative min, max, or neither at x equals 2. As I've written in blue to the right, relative mins and maxes occur simply where f prime changes sign. So let's just write uh, first of all, we know what f prime is. f prime of x equals 4 minus 2x over x squared minus 4x, that quantity squared. Now let's observe. What happens right at x equals 2? At x equals 2, we have 0 in the numerator and a positive number in the denominator. So let's just write which is equal to 0 at x equals 2. Now what about for x less than 2? 
Well, as we noted, the denominator is always going to be positive. So it really comes down to what happens in the numerator. For x less than 2, we're going to have a negative number. For x greater than 2, we're going to have a positive number. And so we have a relative min. Let's just write it this way. For x less than 2, f prime of x is negative. For x greater than 2, f prime of x is positive. Therefore, f has a relative minimum at x equals 2. And that's all that's needed. Part C is really a variation on what was asked in Part B because critical points are relative mins or maxes. So this just asks for what value of k do I get f prime of x changing sign at x equals negative 5. So we'll just write f prime of x equals k minus 2x over x squared minus kx, the quantity squared. So when will this change sign? Well, the denominator is always positive. And so the question is, when I plug in a negative 5 in for x, I'm going to get 10. So the only way to make uh, f prime of x change sign is for k to be equal to negative 10. So let's just write that out. So we're just saying this function changes sign at x equals negative 5 when k equals negative 10. For partial fractions, much of what we're doing is an algebraic exercise. The calculus part of this really just comes at the end. And all we're saying, as we've written in blue, is that in this case, uh, we need to solve for we need to find a and b such that 1 over x squared minus 6x, I'm going to factor that right now, 1 over x minus 6 times x equals a over x minus 6 plus b over x. Now how we're going to do that is we're going to reconstruct the common denominator. Namely, we're going to multiply this fraction by x over x and this fraction by x minus 6 over x minus 6. In both cases, we're just multiplying by 1, so it doesn't change the uh, value. And now, because the denominators are now common, we're just going to write, therefore, 1 equals ax plus bx minus 6b. Now this has to hold for all values of x. So the only way that can be the case is if because there is no x on this sign, we have to have that a plus b times x equals 0. Otherwise, a changing value of x would change the state of the equation. And we also have that negative 6b equals 1. So from that, we immediately have that b equals negative 1 sixth. And because 
a plus b times x is 0, a times a plus b is 0. Or in other words, <clears throat> a and b are opposites of each other, and so a equals 1 sixth. So now we can perform the integration by writing the integral of f of x dx is the same as the integral of negative one-sixth over x minus six plus positive one-sixth over x. Well, both of these integrals uh, just are a constant with uh, the variable in the denominator, and so we're just going to have, uh, therefore, f of x dx simply equals negative one-sixth ln of the absolute value of x minus six. plus one-sixth ln of the absolute value of x, plus some constant. Now you might ask, how did I know that the integral here, the one over x minus six, was going to be ln of absolute value of x minus six, and Formally, I should have made a u substitution, namely u equals x minus 6, but it goes through in such a simple fashion that I skipped the step.